Okay, we'll do that again. So I'm Samantha Zline. I am the branch manager at the Severna Park Library. Hello and welcome to our presentation on Dungeons and Dragons and Mental Health, hosted by Charlene McPherson, LCSWC, uh, Certified Therapeutic Game Master. We're going to have Charlene go through her presentation for us, and then at the end we will do a little Q&A. Feel free to drop the cues into the chat or just hang on to them for the end of the presentation. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Charlene. I was going to say, drop the cues and I'll have the A. There I go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, like Sam, the, Ms. Samantha said, I am Charlene McPherson. Um, I'm a licensed uh, certified social worker clinical. That's what all them letters mean. Uh, I messed that up even after 13 years of having it. Um, I'm a certified therapeutic game master times two uh, through Game to Grow and Geek Therapeutics. Um, and, uh, this is Dungeons and Dragons and Mental Health, uh, which if you can't tell is one of my favorite topics in the world. Um, I have basically built my entire business around this <laughs> and it's amazing. I love it. So, um, first I wanted to go through and talk about what Dungeons and Dragons is. I don't know how many people are familiar, how many people aren't. Dungeons and Dragons is basically a collaborative group telling story game. Um, and so you uh, actually get together, you sit around a table, the dungeon master or the game master, the person that's running the game, uh, will actually create the world and create the encounters that you are going to have. So um, the players play through characters. The, those are the avatars that they use to, to interact with the dungeon master's world. Um, and you all just tell a story. Um, and that's how I kind of run my games. Um, it's not very combat heavy. Um, it's very role play heavy. Um, there is combat because it does have its uses. Um, I love the puzzles as well. Those are always fun. And I don't know if anybody remembers skill challenges for, from a while ago, but skill, yes, <laughs> skill challenges are so much fun to get people um, acquainted with their characters. So, um, you know, obviously at, at, at the, the kind of base, you know, when you're playing this game, you basically tell the dungeon master or the, the game master, I want to do this thing. I want to go fight the monster. And I say, okay, go attack the monster on your turn. Roll initiative, attack the monster. Um, and you roll a D20 dice. Um, and there's a picture of it right here. There's 20 sided dice. Um, and that simulates chance in the world, right? Um, and you add the modifiers that you have for your character. So some of your characters are really good at certain things. So if you're a sneaky rogue type, like a ninja almost, you're going to be really good at sneaking um, around. So you're going to get a plus two modifier on that sneaking, right? Um, so you roll your d20, see what you get, add the plus two, and then if you get above a number that the DM has kind of set, then you succeed. If you get below, then you fail. I always like to fail up though, uh, or funny. <laughs> so uh, one example of someone failing and rolling a natural one, which is um, when you roll a natural one in D&D, &D, uh, it's an automatic fail. A lot of players play that way. Um, but I always like to make it spectacularly failing. So uh, in my first game, my dungeon master, somebody rolled a one and they were attacking a goblin. And so they attacked the goblin and they, they hit the goblin, but it stuck on their blade. So they couldn't get the goblin off of the blade um, while they were trying to continue combat. So it was a really funny way, a really fun way to fail. And that's what, that's what I try and do, right? This is a fun game. I want to keep it a fun game. Combat's important. Role play's important. Um, but so is, you know, just having fun. Um, and then for anybody, again, who's not familiar, there's three types of encounters in Dungeons & Dragons. There's combat, there's role play, and there's puzzles. Um, so combat is fighting the monster. You're the hero, and you're going to go fight the monster. Um, which you can see here, look at all the people fighting the dragon. Um, and you, uh, have your skills and you attack, whether through magic or, um, you know, melee, like an ax or a sword 
or if you have like a bow and arrow, you could be a range character um, and you're going to shoot from far away. Um, so that's combat. It's pretty self-explanatory. Role play, and I have a, a picture of Critical Role here. They're pretty uh, heavy on the role play because they're all voice actors and actors in general. So they're very, very good at uh, role playing their characters, like getting into character and actually responding as the character, right? Um, and then the puzzles. The puzzles are so much fun. I love putting people in a room with like random stuff in random places. And um, one of the uh, things that I actually learned in training uh, with Game to Grow, when you're running a puzzle room or something like that, don't have a solution. Um, because what you do is you, you can have an idea in your head, but you, what you want to do is you actually want to go through and reward the creativity of your players. So if they, can't, if they come up with something that's super exciting, and super creative, then you go, actually, yeah, that's the first step towards <laughs> making the puzzle. You know, um, especially in therapeutic games, that's the whole point is we wanna reinforce pro-social behavior, we wanna reinforce creativity, we want to just reinforce having fun and, and thinking outside the box, right? So um, I know that might make some dungeon masters a little, <laughs> a little scared, because I know a lot of people like to plan, but it's so much fun to see people's face light up when they're like, oh, I figured it out. I knew it all along. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> you knew it all along. <laughs> um, I get so excited. So um, those are the three types of, of um, encounters that uh, I use. I tend to be pretty story heavy um, because it is a therapeutic group. Um, my uh, group members, my players actually make characters um, based on their goals that they have um, for uh, cognitive behavioral goals, social skills goals, whatever goals those are. Um, and they make the character to reflect, you know, um, whatever they want to make it reflect. So there's a couple of different um, theories. You know, anybody who's played D&D &D knows that you make the character that you need in the moment. Um, depending on what you're going through, um, you know, where you're at in, as an individual, all of those things, you put that into your character, whether you mean to or not, because you're the one playing the character, right? So there's four different types of characters, usually that people play. When you're a beginner, a lot of times it's you playing yourself, uh, which is totally acceptable um, and useful for me. <laughs> um, playing the complete opposite of yourself, uh, playing an ideal self, um, or playing just a chaos gremlin, which we all need a chaos gremlin every once in a while. Just doing all the, the, the fun, crazy stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, chaos gremlin. Doing all the fun, crazy stuff that we're not allowed to do in real life, you know, in this game, right? Um, and so... This is why um, I immediately, I've been playing D&D since 2004. Um, I was a little late to the game. I was in college, um, but I, I started in 3.5, edition 3.5. Don't ask me any of the rules because that's when I started and I had no idea. I was just playing. <laughs> 5e Five, five is what I know the most. Um, and so um, I've been playing since 2004. Loved it, obviously continue to play, you know, up through college, through graduate school, through um, being a wife, through, I, I am actually the one that introduced my husband to Dungeons and Dragons. Thank you very much. And now he needs an encyclopedia of, of Dungeons and Dragons knowledge. Um, and then um, around 2017, um, I had my individual practice. I was um, looking around for resources because I was like this everyone in the D, D or RPG community knows that D, D and RPGs are inherently therapeutic. Now they're not therapy until you put a therapist at the head, but they're not therapy, they're therapeutic. There's catharsis, there's self, you know, um uh, uh self-care, there's um socializing, there's friendships, there's you know all of those things are inherent in the game. 
right? So if I'm looking to, as a therapist, which I don't know anybody, anybody else out there that's a therapist, it is one of the most frustrating things to try and teach someone social skills one-on-one because normally people are fine one-on-one, you know, they may have a little bit of issues on one-on-one, but mo- the majority of the time you have issues when you're in a group of people, right? Because there's no rules. Nobody tells you what the rules are. Nobody knows, you know, each person or what their likes are, or dislikes are and things like that, right? So this is an amazing place where you can go to socialize that has rules. <laughs> it literally has rules of engagement which for some of my neurodivergent clients really is a great, um, uh, great uh, strength. Um, and it keeps them from being too worried about, uh, reduces their anxiety about coming to the group because they know the rules of the game, right? And if you know the rules of the game, you know how to interact with the other characters, you know what you need to be doing, what your role is in the game and all those things. It kind of takes down that social anxiety a little bit. Um, because the rules are as written, but as a therapist, (laughs) then I go, okay, well, rules as written. However, what are your goals that you want to work on? Right. Um, and so in 2019, I actually, um, (laughs) in my interview at St. John's college in Annapolis for a counseling position, I said, I want to run Dungeons and Dragons therapy groups. (laughs) To my boss and my coworker, and they were like, "Okay," <laughs> which is not the response I expected, but I was very appreciative of it. Um, and so I was like, "Okay, now I've got to go find resources and things like that." 2017 was when I started looking for resources. Not much around at the time. 2019, I found um, a module that Take This had actually written. Um, with uh, Wizards of the Coast um, to kind of represent a mental health journey. Um, And so I used that module with my clients. Um, It was amazing. And I can tell you the first time that I realized that this worked, I had someone who was playing a cleric for anybody who knows that's a holy person who's a healer um, and gets their, their, um, magic from the divine, right? So the God that they are, you know, a patron to. And this person, um, was on the LGBTQ spectrum and was raised Jewish, um, very strict Jewish. And so their religion had been nothing but a judgment zone for them even though they believed in you know what the teachings were the community and things like that it was just the judgment zone for them um so they ended up playing a cleric in my game and in one instance in this module you end up to where you're in an illusion um of your worst fear um Obviously, I tune it down a little bit. I don't go straight for like phobias or anything like that. But um, the uh, the worst uh, one for this person was being alone in the dark. And first, the, their first response, which is everybody's first response, was to run. Second response was to ask for help. And nothing happened during those moments. Like me running the game. I was like, no, you don't hear anything. There's nobody there. You gotta, you gotta work this out yourself. And as soon as I said that, they said, okay, I start focusing on my holy symbol for my character. And I said, as you start focusing on your holy symbol, you see a little light start to flicker far away. It, it's, it's just flickering. It's not a flame yet, but it, it's flickering on and off. And they said, okay, I concentrate on it harder. And I think about my deity and how they're, they're going to help me and keep, give me strength and, you know, all this stuff. And as, as they were going further and further into like using their character's religion as a strength, the flame got bigger and bigger and bigger. And once they got to the flame, the illusion went away. Right. And 
that person before they walked out of my office. And this was the first time that it had, and I still get goosebumps. They were like, oh, you know what? I can actually use my religion as a strength to get through really hard things. It's like, even if, even if it has been really hard on me, there are certain aspects that I can use to help me through hard times. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, and so that was when I got hooked. <laughs> and I was like, this works. I know it. And so I'm going to build my career on this because as you can tell, I'm not a, um, let's say, um, hmm, uh, run of the mill therapist, I guess. Um, the, the staunch professional that wears, you know, uh, jackets, suit jackets and stuff like that. I have blue hair. I, you know, <laughs> I wear soot sprites. Like, I love nerd culture, right? Um, and at that point, I realized where I was supposed to be. And that was doing therapy and using RPGs as a therapeutic tool because that's my personality. I want to get down on the same level as my client and say, hey, you're not going through this alone. I'm here with you. And that's what you do as a GM and a therapist. So it just meshes completely together, right? Um, and one of the things from the trainings in Geek Therapeutics and Game to Grow is, is that to do this job as a therapist, you have to be willing to play. You have to be willing to have fun because if you're not having fun, then no one else is going to have fun. And the whole point is, is to practice while we're having fun, right? Practice social skills. So if everybody's just sitting there going, you know, and I'm like, well, you need to do blah, 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 this rule. Blah, blah, blah. No one's going to get anything done. No social skills are going to get practiced. No cognitive behavioral goals are going to get practiced. It's just going to be everybody um, just sitting there staring at each other. Um, and so as a GM, I set the tone. I set the tone of the game. And so when we started to go, yeah, you remember last time so-and-so went and they climbed that pillar and then did like a, a body slam on the, the big bad guy and she couldn't get up. And then they used, this is a real story. They actually used the, um, oh gosh, the immovable rod and put it on her neck so she couldn't get up. And I was like, dang, my big bad evil guy can't get up off the ground. <laughs> what do I do with this? <laughs> Luckily she had some bam thing. Uh, <laughs> capabilities. But, you know, I go through and I get excited and I get down on the level and I go, you know, this is what we're doing. We're, we're here to have fun. We're here also to work, right? So the work is actually where I create the encounters, right? I will purposefully create an encounter to um, help someone work on their goals, right? So if someone uh, needs to uh, speak up more for themselves, to advocate for themselves, you know, that type of thing, they're the only one that the king will talk to when they're trying to convince the king to give them the job. Um, if they are someone who um, wants to interact socially more, you know, I have one player who has social anxiety and decided to play a deposed king. Uh, that was very uh, regal and entitled and just a complete butt um, about everything. He, at certain points, one point, uh, this character took all of the health potions to himself because he was the king. He, he should div divvy out the health potions, um, which is the complete opposite of somebody who has anxiety, you know, social anxiety, who's a quiet, you know, social anxiety person, right? And so, he has to go into this game every week and play the opposite of him, right? And so that's where those characters come in, their backstories, you know, um, when I have them making their characters, I do have them think about their goals. And I say, you can put as much of you in it as you want or as little of you in it as you want. I'm not gonna force you to, you know, go all in or whatever, right? This is up to you where you're at, that's what we'll do. Um, and so, um, we will create a character together, right? Like I have someone who 
um, again, wants to like advocate and things like that and, and is really big about justice and things like that. And so they're going to be a paladin, you know, and so they're going to go through the world with their mindset that they already have in the real world and go through this fantasy world and practicing these things uh, in person to be able to stand up for themselves and advocate for themselves and communicate, positively communicate and things like that. So it's, it's amazing to see these people like just be who they really want to be at this table, right? It doesn't happen automatically. Obviously, you know, group dynamics, you have to kind of get used to each other and everything like that. Um, but what I do is I sign people up for six week sessions. Um, and I, I, as far as I know, I'm the only one that does this. I actually highly recommend that my clients see me individually as well as for group. So I run the social skills group. They have their, their um, goals in mind. And then I just think it's too much to process right after that. So I have my clients come in, you know, for an individual session during the week for an hour and we process it together, um, where their character is, where they want their character to go, how they felt, was there anything that, you know, resulted as, as part of the game. Um, and again, as a therapist, being in the social situation with your client, when they have social anxiety, or they're constantly judging themselves, or saying people hate me, and, you know, things like that, I'm there, I know exactly what's happening. I can see the situation from my point of view, obviously, but I can help to kind of reality check those, those anxious thoughts and be like, oh, you think so-and-so was angry at you? What did, what did you see that, that um, you know, made you think they were angry at you? Because I didn't, I didn't really see anything while I was there. And that to me is invaluable as a therapist, especially when you're teaching social skills, because when you're in therapy one-on-one -on -one and they're telling you these situations, you have no idea what's actually going on, right? What the environment is, who they're talking to, you know, all those things. Here, I see it all. And then we go and we process it one-on-one -on -one together. Um, so I really, really like that setup. It's kind of more like a DBT program um, setup, um, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, the last thing I just wanted to say is, um, the, the trainings, just some GM tips, regular GM tips, if people want, want those, um, I wanted to go through, uh, and say like, you know, in my games, the way that I make it therapeutic and keep it therapeutic is by using safety tools. Um, and I think this is a big push in the gaming community now, um, is to use safety tools, which is amazing. Even if you're a therapeutic DM or just a regular DM or a GM, whatever, use safety tools. There's the RPG consent form. Um, and there's something called an, R, uh, an X card system. Um, sorry, I completely forgot about the, the thing. I got excited. <laughs> the X card system. Um, you uh, actually, with the X card system, you have a card down in the middle of the table. And if you're getting close to, well, first I have people fill out the RPG consent form. The RPG consent form has topics on there and you get to choose whether it's an okay topic eh, eh, topic, or a no-go topic. And I have to, as my job, it is my job to make sure that those things aren't touched um, to steer people away from it, right? Um, now, you know, there are things that you can get near and people get a little nervous there too during the game. So we have the X card and the X card system is in the middle of the table, I actually adapted it a little bit for myself. I have an X card, an N card, and a uh, O card. So the X card is stop immediately. We're on something. I can't do this. This is too much. We need to change the subject and go a different route immediately with no questions asked. And that is absolutely fine. We have the, the N card is there so that you're saying, okay, we're getting near something that I'm not quite comfortable with. So can we kind of steer away from it? And then the O card I put in so that if you and your, your character are going through something super um, deep or, you know, whatever during the game, you can press the O card to check in with the other players and say, hey, is everybody okay? You know, I know this is super deep. Um, this is super, 
you know, intense. So I just wanted to check in and make sure everybody was okay with what was going on. Um, and I make sure my clients know that from the back that they can use this. Do not be embarrassed. Do not hesitate because I want to make sure this game is safe for everybody, a safe space for everyone. Um, so I have had people fill out the RPG consent form. I haven't had anybody yet uh, need to use the X card or anything like that, but it's there if they need it. Um, and that's the important part for me. Um, but other than that, I think that's all I had. Um, if anybody has any questions, look, see, I'm right on time. Look at that. Oh, okay. I've got a question coming. Well, I was going to say, question. <laughs> question. Answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I also would like to talk a little bit more. Uh, I know the slide before this, you had a little bit about um, Geek Therapeutics and uh, yes. Game to Grow to talk a little bit about them um, and what they do. But I'll let uh, um, Abe, do you want to unmute and talk or do you just want to type it in chat? Up to you. Okay, there we go. Sorry. Okay. Um, so yeah, do you have It's all good, yeah. Um, okay. Basically, so, and this is actually, so uh, long and short, uh, I, I summed it up right there, but pretty much I'm in the, I've also got uh, two different uh, certifications. I got mine from Geek Therapy and also from um, the Bodana Group. Yes, yes. i in Game to Grow so I can get the full Triforce, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so where I am is as I've described I'm in the, so do you have any tips for someone getting into this area of the field aside mm -hmm. from doing the trainings and aside from playing games for fun? Because that's uh, the playing the games for fun is my next step. I still need experience with the systems and running games, but more for the professional angle of this, what do you think? Um, yeah, and it, it also depends on where you're coming from. So like if you're an educator or a therapist or whatever, it's going to change. So if you don't mind me asking what kind of oh, direction of course, you're coming uh, from. I'm a therapist. Okay. Uh, so, LPC in Pennsylvania. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, I would, <laughs> I have not met too much resistance actually. Uh, and people are kind of surprised about that. Um, I would go all out. What if you are in a group of therapists, we have one from Maryland. I posted in there, hey, I'm starting this <laughs> the D, D social skills group. If you have anybody that you think would, you know, um, uh, benefit from that, um, send them my way. And I didn't get a negative response. Everybody was like, oh my God, that's so cool. It's great. That's a great idea. That's such a great idea. So um, my initial, you know, um, response was to be a little hesitant because this is such a, um, you know, kind of new type of, of intervention. Um, but I like to think, and all the therapists will, will kind of, uh, giggle here a little bit. Uh, I like to think we're like the, uh, the Becks and the Skinners of our generation, just in the D and D therapy world, so we're we're the beginning. We're the ones who are going to be doing the research to back up the practice, right? Um, and so you have to do it. So I wouldn't hesitate um, because I know that at least for me, uh, I had been told, and that's why it took me eleven years to get here. I had been told over and over again, "Oh, you're not professional. You don't dress professional. You don't." you know, you don't have good boundaries. You don't, you know, blah, 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 right? And just accepting who you are as a therapist is the first step in this. You have to, you have to be confident with who you are. Um, so I would, that's the main thing when you are talking to other people, if you're confident, they'll be confident. Um, and I heard, I learned that the hard way because I was like, oh, well, uh, I'm doing this thing. And now I'm like, hey, look, I run into groups. <laughs> to everybody I run into. I don't know if that helps at all. So uh, yes, it does. Uh, also, did you talk about uh, within that, any general concepts, tips, whatever regarding um, planning your sessions? How do you plan interventions to put in? How do you, anything like that? Because I think one of the things that's making things difficult for me is getting my head around how I'm going to actually get in and do it. Does that make sense? Yes. And that was my first um, uh, 
worry too. I was like, okay, how do I make sure I'm creating encounters that are therapeutic, right? Or helping people meet, reach their goals. So what I did was I, I'm, I'm work smarter, not harder. Uh, I got um, Game to Grow's Critical Core that they made. Um, I was a Kickstarter backer. I had the digital version. I printed out the encounters and I ran them through those encounters because if, if you all have seen Critical Core, um, the encounters at the top actually have, oh, you're working on teamwork and perspective taking and this and that. So it was kind of a guide for me to be like, these are the type of encounters that you know, help them practice these things, right? And so that really helped me kind of follow through with that. But of course, I let them do an open world, right? Um, uh, so, so, so wait, uh, for my understanding, so what you did was yep. you used Critical Core particularly and the modules inherent to that to get yourself into it, figure out how to move forward with it and kind of set that path for yourself. Yes, and so uh, wow. I, do, I do six week um, sessions but the, the first group that I started with back in June of last year is just now ending their campaign. Um, and I ran them through all three arcs of the Critical Core campaign, plus the overarching um, arc that I created from their backstories that they gave me, um, as well as their um, you know, goals and things like that. So I took the pre-written and fitted it to the overarching story um, to their backstories. And it's, it's worked. I'm going to finish a campaign for the first time. I know everybody, <laughs> anybody who's played D&D knows that finishing a campaign is a, a feat within itself. Um, so I'm very excited about that. We're at the big, bad, evil guy um, uh, episode. I say episodes because I'm used to podcasts. Um, you know, this session and I'm very excited to throw these uh, these at these people. Um, and I'm just seeing questions in the in the the chat. This is for adults. Um, I'm working. Mo bo both of my groups that I have right now are 30 plus year olds. Um, this is not just for kids, and that's something that I'm really really passionate about. Is like adulting sucks. And I think we can pretty much all agree on that, that the world has got mood. a lot going on. <laughs> just, just mood, retweet, upvote. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So um, why do we have to not play? Right? Like, why do we have to take something away that not only is enjoyable, but teaches us social skills? Because some of us, me included, didn't get diagnosed with ADHD until I was 35, right? And so I could use a social skills group as an ADHD -er at 35. You go find me a social skills group for a 35 year old without it being a tragedy. There's, there's nothing, absolutely nothing. And, and look at the research. There's research on tabletop games and therapeutics, how it can be therapeutic, but go and look for the age range of 25 plus, you will get absolutely nothing in between 25 and say 65. There's absolutely nothing about socialization, isolation, community, survival, uh, just in general, knowing how to do things. All of those things um, are just, they're not there. And so I was like, I know I'm part of a big group of at least you know, female identifying people who are late diagnosed ADHD because I was just social. I was just extra social. That was my problem. I couldn't stop talking. I couldn't, you know, but now that I know it was ADHD, I'm like, I know there's others out there. And, and as a therapist, I know there are others out there being diagnosed late with, you know, some neurodiverse, um, you know, uh, uh, diagnosis. And there's no resources because they're just like, okay, you're 25, go on, you're an adult now, have fun. You know, you know what you're doing. And I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Somebody help me. <laughs> so I wanted to be that for uh, the, that specific, um, you know, community. I know, Zachary, I think you had your hand up. 
Uh, John Gartner had a question, but okay, I John got to post, post it. And John was next. He's been waiting so patiently. <laughs> yeah. My original question was to ask what age group you do therapy for, but you already asked that. Um, okay. So I'm going to, I'll follow it up with another one because I've always wanted to advocate the game to new players. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe middle school would be the niche. Maybe high school might be a little too old. And then so some of the things you're saying are interesting because I'm obviously going to run a game for, for fun, not for therapy, because mm -hmm. I'm right. Um, but some of the ideas you had are good to have as boundaries for your new players. Anyway, um, now I forgot what my freaking question was. No, but you're I, okay. Um, I guess my question is, are there any resources that you know of for, for middle school players? Introducing a game for that. Is that something you can do a search online and I can find some stuff or? Yeah, so Game to Grow is really big no. into working with kids. Okay. Um, that's part of the reason why I got the Geek Therapeutics on top of it because Geek Therapeutics was a little bit more adult and yeah. they, Game to Grow does work with adults. Um, they have a whole, um, Jared um, Kilmer is actually the head of uh, counseling at Game to Grow and he works with adult groups and things like that. And I know Elizabeth Kilmer, um, Dr. Kilmer, she also works with uh, veterans. She has worked with veterans in the VA using the game to kind of help the socialization and stuff like that with PTSD. Um, so, uh, and Geek Therapeutics did talk about kids as well. Um, and, and that's the thing is, is like, uh, you can find a lot of resources, a lot of research and everything like that on kids using this game more than it's not, I mean, it's not like CBT level, but it's, you know, you've got more research out there than you do about playing for adults because adult play is a taboo, you know, completely. So, um, but yeah, they have tons of information. If you take their training, it's, it's amazing. Um, and I have a week, uh, bi-weekly consultation group with one of the founders from Game to Grow, um, who's been doing this for 10 years. And any questions I have, he's already done it. He has an answer or he works with you to figure out the answer. Um, it's the Adams. Uh, if anybody knows Game to Grow, it's Adam and Adam. <laughs> They're the two that started it, Adam Davis uh, <laughs> um, but, and Adam Johns. But, um, you know, those are really good places to look. Um, and I know there's, you know, other therapists that are definitely play therapists are using this as a, as a tool as well. So if you want to look into the play therapy realm as well, um, you might find a lot of, of resources there as well. All right. Thanks. Yep. Uh, okay. Charlene, we had a question from Nicole and Jason uh, about <laughs> insurance reimbursement and working with trauma work and controlled environments, um, taking triggers with the consent form being tailored to that. Right. So, um, if you all get anything out of this, we do not um, induce, reinduce trauma. We don't put people through their trauma again to try and face it. That is not the point of this game in any way, shape, or form. Um, I, I know there was a second question in there and I completely forgot it, but I wanted to, <laughs> to make this point um, that with trauma work, um, and as, you know, pretty much any therapist knows, you're not trying to put them through the situation again. You're just trying to teach them coping mechanisms, you know, psychoeducate, and then do the narration, but do it very, very slowly, right? As a therapist, you go at their pace. And recreating a trauma in a D&D &D game is not what we're going for. We're going for, okay, you have a trauma history, right? So what are some of the symptoms that are left over from that? Okay, well, I have one trauma client who is like fiercely independent, does not rely on anybody, um, and is now playing a wizard or sorcerer, sorry, who depends on other people for healing. <laughs> so this person, when they built their character, they didn't think of this. They were playing the game and they realized, they came to me and was like, I have to rely on others to heal me. <laughs> yes, you do. You do. <laughs> you do. It's amazing. Um, so you could take symptoms and things like that and, and kind of build it into, but you are always working with the client 
at the level that they're at. You're not recreating trauma. You're just working on some of the, the kind of external symptom type stuff. Um, I don't remember what the first question was before the trauma thing. <laughs> Sorry, I got excited. It's okay. No, there's, there's a lot of questions in the chat. I'm just trying to keep mm -hmm. track of them all. Um, I lost it. Feel free to chime in. Nicole. I think the other question was about insurance. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, there that it was it. Well, that's why I skipped it because I hate insurance. Okay, so <laughs> insurance is the worst. <laughs> it's great to have it. I'm not, not trying to, but so I tend to be pretty conservative ethically. Um, I figure if I don't step towards it, I can't step in it. Um, so um, the way I run my groups, um, I talk to my biller, I hired a biller who knows I'm only paneled with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and I talked to my biller and I said, hey, I want to run social skills groups. Is that covered under Blue Cross? And she went and looked it up and, you know, got the information and stuff. And social skills groups are not covered by Blue Cross. Now, some of these games, if you label them as therapeutic games, can get reimbursed as normal group at normal group rates, but it depends on the insurance. And I hate um, taking chances with insurance, with people's money, with people's time. You know, I want to make sure they know exactly what they're getting into before they get into it. So you know what your benefits are immediately before you see me so that you're not hit with a $100 bill later down the line. So what I do is I take insurance for the individual sessions, but the groups are self-pay um, because it's innovative. I'd have to fight the insurance company probably to get them to cover it because it's, you know, just play, you know, for adults. Um, and so, and they're not covering it anyway. So what I would do is, you know, find somebody who knows the billing stuff with your in specific insurance company that you're paneled under, um, and then figure it out from there. Cause it's gonna be different. And this is the reason why I hate insurance. It's gonna be different with every single insurance company and every single person you talk to in the insurance company. Usually is like completely different answers. You get like completely different answers. So that's why I hired a biller to deal with that. So that's the answer there. Um, Sophia had a question. She says, I've DM'd homebrew campaigns, but I found 5e kind of overwhelming to learn when I was a player. How do you teach game mechanics in a way that's brief to your players? So um, <laughs> I try and get, I just basically tell them, trust me, like this is overwhelming. We'll create the character to get, I walk people through it. So like I will create the character with my clients. I won't just send them out and be like, okay, create your character. You know, we'll talk about it. We'll, you know, do the backstory. That's why I have, there's um, a, a backstory thing called Knives, Forks, and Spoons that Game to Grow uh, told me about in their training. I have them answer questions about their backstory instead of just trying to sit there and come up with a backstory, right? Um, so just getting them to understand that you are willing to teach them as you're playing which is the way that I learn. I can't read those manuals. Honestly, I have not read one of those through. Um, <laughs> honestly. Um, but I've listened to a podcast for 10 years now. I don't know if anybody knows Greetings Adventures, um, but I've been listening to them for 10 years, um, listening to the rules, how they interact with each other, how they DM, how they do all those things. Um, and that really helped me learn the rules. Um, so I tell people, if you want to go and listen to a podcast, a real play podcast, that's a really good play, first place to start. Um, because it's not intimidating. You're just listening to a story and listening to other people play. So then you can listen along and, you know, see what the DM says and things like that. Right. Um, I usually steer people away from critical role because even though it's amazing, I love it. I'm up to date on all the episodes. It's overwhelming. Um, because each episode is four hours and they look at that and there's like 200 and some 300 and some episodes. Now people get overwhelmed when they immediately see that once they get into a little bit, I'm like, okay, now might be a good time to, maybe you could get into critical role, you know, now that you know what's going on. 
So I just model as a therapist, I model that behavior. When I don't know a rule, I go, oh, well, what do you all think? What do you all think the rule should be? I don't go into a book. I don't argue with people. I want to keep the game going, right? And so I'll let the group make a decision together, you know? Or if I know somebody is a, um, knows all the rules, I'll be like, hey, what do you think? What does this go under? You know, because you know D&D can get real funky, um, you know, when you want to do something. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, I'll make you do a dexterity check, but then you got to do a strength check, and then you got to, uh, uh, well, I don't know, maybe. Um, and then you got the chaotic player with the beans. Never give your players the, the beans, the bag of beans in D&D 5e. It's just chaos, Ch absolute chaos. <laughs> Throw a bean and you never know what's coming out. Um, but yeah, so I would model the behavior for them. You know, I'll walk you through it here. This is what this means. This is what that means. You know, this is what the backgrounds mean. You know, the backgrounds can get overwhelming when you're, you're picking it, right? Um, these, these are what the stats mean. I love the tomato reference, you know, um, strength is crushing a tomato, you know, that whole thing. Um, and just, again, model that behavior of I'm willing to come and learn with you because I am learning with you. There are new rules that I'm learning every single day. And so that's what I would say, you know, is this like, it's okay. You know, I don't know all the rules and we're going to do it together. And podcasts. They want to listen. <laughs> um, I know Zachary had his hand up. Zach, do you still have a question? I think we lost. No. Okay. Okay. And then um, Allison, I know Allison had a question. That's me. Um, so I had a question about um, boundaries like within the D and D community. Um, I am, um, I guess kind of heavily involved with a, a nerdy group in Baltimore city. Um, for those of you in, in or around Baltimore city, there's a bar here called Nolan beyond um that caters to gamers and i i frequent um i frequent that place it is a home away from home for me but i worry about if i were to start doing a group like this mm -hmm. would i then start seeing the um you know my clients the people in the group at you know this place where i frequent and how do you kind of navigate oh are you going to see these people um in other like, you know, D and D nerdy safe spaces. Hopefully that yeah. it's been a long day. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely fine. <clears throat> so um, at least, you know, as a social worker, our ethics are, you know, um, if you are gonna see that person more than just for group, usually that's where you would wanna find a referral. Right. Um, you know, so if you have somebody around, but if there is no referral resource, which again, I, I think I'm one of the only ones doing, you know, groups with adults that are like 30 plus, um, then you just kind of, I, I would contact your ethics board um, or, you know, I, I, I don't know if you're a therapist or um, a community member, um, but if you're a therapist, contact your ethics board, talk to them about it. But like the, the other thing too is, is that um, the gaming community is a small community, right? And we all kind of congregate at these, these places. Um, I went to PAX East and saw everybody, um, including, <laughs> including Ms. Smith over here. We live 20 minutes away from each other, but we met in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I would just weigh, you know, uh, very ethically, you know, whether you're going to have like contact with that person. And I always tell my clients too, if I see you out in the wild, I'm not going to say hi to you. And right. that's not because I'm being mean. It's because I'm keeping your confidentiality. If you say hi, I'll wave back. Right. But, um, you know, so I think it would just depend on the situation. Um, mm -hmm. If you can't refer out then, because I know in some rural areas, right, like there is no other therapist. So you have to see so-and-so that you've known since you were six, you know, <laughs> and see them for therapy because there's no other therapist. Right. Um, and of, of course, since, you know, we can't practice cross state lines, 
makes it even worse. So I would just, you know, um, be careful and maybe market to not there. Yeah. Maybe market to other stores um, that you aren't as heavily involved in. Um, I definitely, I've marketed with um, games and stuff, uh, Third Eye Comics, and I always forget the, the one in Ellicott City. And it's it's a, called like Games Core or something like that. Gamer Core, that's what it is. Um, and it was started by three or four veterans, which I love. And they're really into creating a community. So um, I might, you know, might not uh, market for my home store if I'm super involved with it. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, if there's people there that need it, you can at least be a resource to refer out. That makes sense. You okay. Know? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I know Bree had um, their hand raised earlier. Do you still have a question, Bree? Yeah. And so I, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to put it in the chat or, or raise my hand. Yeah, I actually just had a question about, and you may not be able to, to answer this, um, mm -hmm. non-therapeutically, um, so like not billing, not not processing any of this through billing, but just curious if an agency approached about running one of these, you know, type of games for them, for a group of individuals. Um, so I actually had an agency that had approached me about starting up this type of thing. And I wasn't sure if there was anything against like charging for it. So like, if I wanted to go in, if they wanted to hire me to say, run a weekly group for a set of, you know, say six individuals, or, you know, I, I don't know, is there like a set rate or is there anything against like, you know, them paying me for the services for me to go in and set up a group? Like I said, not, not necessarily therapeutic. Um, it's a foster care agency. Um, and as a social worker, they had just approached me about possibly, you know, setting up to run a group. Yeah. So, so. yeah. So that was a hard part, um, picking the reimbursement rate. Like, what do I do with this? Like what's affordable? What's, you know, um, and I'm a sucker. So <laughs> I started charging not as much as what I should have in the beginning. Um, and so what I did eventually was look at the social skills groups in the area what their rates were and just kind of went off of that. Um, now for just DMing a game without therapeutics involved in it, um, I am not, I'm unsure of what, I know that there are people who DM and GM games who get paid. Um, I don't know what the rates are because um, I'm not in that, that side of the community yet. Um, but Anyone who's actually tried to DM a game knows that it is a whole heck of a lot of work. Um, and then you add in trying to deal with social skills and therapeutic goals and, you know, all that stuff on top of it. If it's an agency that you're working, especially a foster care agency, and you're a social worker, you need to get paid for your time because this is not, yeah. this is not easy. This is not easy stuff. Um, I just so, didn't know if there was any, because they, they have said to me, like, we're not necessarily going to bill for this. They just kind of want to do a trial run, see how it goes, see if people are interested. And I didn't know if like, you know, the D and D world had any set, you know, stipulations because I have only gone to free events. I I've only played free games, gone to free games, gone to groups where there was no charge involved. So I didn't know if there was any, you yeah. know, any regulations where D&D &D might say you can't charge for these games or you no. can't get yeah. paid to run one of these games. So I guess that was kind of more my question. Like, yeah. are there any, any regulations against getting paid? Because it, no. it is a lot of time and yeah. a lot of energy. <laughs> and that's what I told my clients. I said, look, I do more work for this group than I do individual therapy. Like this I am spending at least 45 minutes per person per week to build the campaign, to get your goals together. So, you know, and all, so that's three or four hours a week per one and a half hour group. That's where I don't do that with individual. I go in individual, we do the individual therapy. <laughs> you know, if I need to prepare something, I do. Every therapist knows when you prepare something, it never gets brought up anyway. 
Um, and then I do my notes. That's it. That's an hour. Whereas like this game, I have to write the story. I have to write the goals. I have to write the encounters. I have to anticipate where the heck they're going to go. Um, <laughs> Cause Lord knows you got that chaos gremlin that likes to, you know, go off into the cave to go look for some gold, which is where one of my groups is. Um, so, and, and as far as the rates, I, I was looking in the chat, as far as I had heard $20 an hour per, um, uh, per person, I think, um, is, is pretty, um, standard for DMs, um, from what I, what I understand. Anybody else can chime in if you, if you know more about this than, than I do. Thank you so much yeah. for, for answering that question. I appreciate it. Yeah. And, you know, I looked at the social skills groups in the area and I was like, okay, they're charging $50 for 45 minutes. I'm running an hour and a half game and then putting two or three hours on top of it. So I'm going to charge, I'm going to have to charge for that to keep it sustainable. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how I came up with my, um, you know, my rates and things like that. Um, could I add something in regarding <clears throat> bill and reimbursement in the context of insurance? Mm -hmm. So I was having a conversation with someone about this yesterday <clears throat> and she had said, so, I don't know too, too much about this, but she said something about looking at add-on codes. Mm -hmm. I have yet to explore that. I mean, let's talk about a year from now and I might have some more answers. However, that being said, if that is something that is in your realm, if you can ask the right people that mention this phrase add-on codes in the context of billing to insurance, you might be able to get a little extra. Yeah. Well, and that's what, um, as far as I know, the people who have been successful have just billed it as a regular therapy group. Um, especially if you can get the VA to cover it, you can usually get, you know, insurance cover, uh, insurance to cover it. But again, it's so new that insurance companies look at you and say, what do you want to do? What, what is this? I don't even understand. Unless you get a gamer who's on the other end of the phone, they're going to understand the value of it. But you're talking to an insurance agent who's like, I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> so I have no idea how to give you an answer here. Um, so uh, that's what I've heard. But there are additional codes, especially if you're doing it over telehealth, you're supposed to have an additional code here, there. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, I'm sure as we get more and more into, you know, more people doing it, more people billing insurance, more people doing this stuff that the insurance companies will eventually catch up. But right now they're like, what are you doing? I don't understand. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. That was some great, great questions. Great conversation. Um, it is eight o'clock. So I'm going to free Charlene from her bonds for the evening. <laughs> That's all right. I love this. This is amazing. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Charlene, for spending your evening with us. Thank you guys for logging on and spending this hour with us. Um, I threw in the chat the program feedback form, um, which the library always appreciates, especially if you have suggestions or ideas for other programs you would like to see. It's always nice to know that I'm going to host a program that people will show up for. Um, so if there's other things you'd like us to do at the library, um, in person or online, you know, drop it in that feedback form. Let us know if you want to see more of Charlene. Maybe we can try to work out some other kinds of presentations or activities together. Um, I also mentioned Anne Arundel County Public Library is starting up some D&D groups. I know the Odenton Library has the D20 Club that meets up very re uh, regularly. I think they're monthly right now. Um, they've been going for a long time, but they're a very welcoming group and they're always happy to add new members. Uh, my branch, Severna Park Library, we're just getting started. We have a June program on the books. Um, they're Wednesday evening, uh, the second Wednesday evening in June, but it's on the calendar. If you look at our website, you can sign up for that. We're going to try to do them once a month for the next few months and see how many people show up. Um, Corey, I don't know about Severn Library, but feel free to stop by and say hello to the staff there and let them know you're interested because the more people that ask, again, if someone's going to show up, we love to host programs that people are going to show up for. Um, and I also mentioned too, we have the Dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons guides in the library, pretty much, I think all the books at this point, one of my staff has been reading them all at the 
the desk. So I've seen all the covers. Um, so you don't have to break the bank to go and buy all of those if you're just researching this and you want to dabble. Um, and if you're not local to Anne Arundel County, there's lots of libraries in the country that do have these books. So um, again, you don't you don't have to um, spend all the money right up front. You can borrow them from your local library, talk to your library about using the, um, the room or things like that. We're all trying to do things that bring people together. Um, like Charlene said, this is a great chance to practice those social skills, especially after a couple of years of kind of being trapped in this virtual world. It's nice to sit down together and, ch and chat and have fun and roll some dice and just have a good time. Um, and again, your local library wants to do things that you'll show up for. So, you know, put a bug in their ear, let them know. Um, it's definitely something that is happening all over. So they shouldn't be too surprised about it. And you can always <laughs> tell them to call Charlene if they need some suggestions for games to run. <laughs> Exactly. Hey, you got it. Have a <laughs> so um, again, thank you guys so much and have a great night. And I hope I see you around the library. Yep. Roll you 20. Can find me on, yeah, <laughs> you can find me on social media. I'm all over the place if you have any questions. Thanks again, guys. Bye. Thank you.